You're watching Rogers TV. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Very fortunate today to have somebody I've known for a number of years, uh, Cheryl Forchuk, who uh, it's hard for me, Cheryl, to know how to describe you. I mean, I've known you <laughs> for a while, and then I went on to the net last night and researched you some more just to, so I could introduce you, and I realized I just can't. There are so many accomplishments <laughs> in your life, so many awards, so, many rec so, so much recognition, so much in the way of publications, uh, research papers. You know, it, it's... It's amazing what you have done. And you're sitting here right in the middle of London, Ontario. And I think often we we probably overlook just some of the real gems we have in this community, and you're one of them. So what I, I do know, and which I knew before I started doing the research, was that you're the Ivy Research, one of the Ivy Research Chairs for Aging, Mental Health, Rehabilitation, and Recovery. But you're so much more. Could you take us in through some of the highlights of some of the other things that you're responsible sure. for? And, and thank you, Glenn. That's uh, very, very kind. And before I introduce the rest of myself, I, ha I have to say that I, I accomplished none of that on my own. I always work with other people. And um, speaking of one, like our community partners have, have been incredible, uh, people with lived experience. So uh, I, I, sometimes as the researcher, you get more of the accolades, but it's always a team sport. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I do, I do have the Ivy Research Chair from the uh, Richard and Burl Ivy family donated uh, that money to have a research chair at the Parkwood Institute, which covers the aging and yeah. mental health buildings to support research there. It, it also comes under Lawson, which I have behind me, yeah. uh, which is the research arm of the London Hospitals. I'm an assistant director, uh, scientific director, assistant scientific director for Lawson. And uh, by background, I'm a, a psychiatric mental health nurse. That's where my PhD is. I'm with the School of Nursing and cross appointed to the Department of Psychiatry. So I'll, I'll sort of take that as the mm -hmm. the, the broad strokes. But um, I, I, and I always say, although I am a researcher, I I try to do. Um, I, I see myself as a as a, a clinician, or cl clinician and research clothing, in that um, as a practitioner, there's so many things you see, and I'm sure you. I know 100 percent you see this as well, where we try so hard to deal with things one person at a time when they're really systemic issues, uh, and that's really the reason I went into research rather than trying to get the one-off workarounds. Like how 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 do we fix things on a broader level? Yeah. And and you've I know that's one thing we've generally had in common over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll probably end up talking about a number of things because I don't think this will be our only interview if you're good enough to come back in the future. But I, I do think that it's really important for me. I want to discuss the homelessness issue. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I do is that, you know, during COVID, for instance, the food bank gave out lots, you know, over a million dollars just in meals for homeless folks. I know that there were winter shelter programs. I know that there were all these other uh, efforts that were done to try to to handle a lot of it. it a lot of it was on an emergency basis, right, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a long term basis. And but I also remember uh, from my time being in Parliament, being on committees, and other things when we discussed homelessness, it often became so much more. And oh, yeah. My worry in London is, is that we, uh, in, in speaking with folks and being involved with various committees and with other groups and dealing with homelessness, is that because it, they're having trouble finding space, uh, to put people into to be able to assist them and give them some uh, security. Homelessness has primarily become an accommodation issue. Mm -hmm. in, you know, we, we need a physical place to put people yeah. in. 
And yet, you know this way better than the rest of us, but it seems to me that it's really far greater than that. Yeah. And I don't want to just get into what is it all. I, I want to get into the fact that I think often in looking at it as an accommodation issue, we fail to see the personal trauma and strengths and other things that people are homeless are going through. And I'd really like to touch that with you if we could do that today. But would you agree with me on that assessment? Oh, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, there's an old saying that uh, when you're looking at homelessness, it's always about housing, but it's never only about housing, right? Yeah. Um, be because why was this particular person vulnerable? What, what were some of the other issues? And what are some of the issues that have changed the person after they became homeless that now have to be dealt with? Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you've been involved in? Because you've had projects that have actually been involved in this field. Oh, yeah, and, quite and, a few. <laughs> yeah, I know. And on and, and the mental health side, especially, I, I'm very curious about it. So could you go into some of those for me? Yeah. That yeah. Helps and, you broaden your understanding. Yes. And and um, uh, one of the advantages and disadvantages of being very old uh, is that you, you know where things used to be. And I, I always talk to the students in the next generation you know for example i meet with the psychiatry residents and talk about these issues as we get each new crop in at the um at the hospitals and they're often shocked that we didn't always have a homeless problem and that our clients particularly with mental illness did not always have uh, a homeless problem and what really it what really drove it home to me and got me started in this um, area, I, I remember time working at a provincial uh, psychiatric hospital as an advanced practice nurse, and we would go over incidents um, that that were really unsafe. Mm. And at that time, if we discharged someone to homelessness, even if they came in homeless, the the incident report was the same one that would be filled out as a patient assault. Interesting. That yeah. that's that's how rare it was, and yeah. I remember yeah. one year it happened twice in one year, <laughs> and we had a big meeting about like how could this possibly happen? This is the second time we've discharged. In both cases, the person came in homeless. Yeah, uh, and um, again, like I'm talking thirty years ago, but we did not always have this problem, um, and mental health, mental illness is a big part of the, the picture. When I um, I had a project looking at discharge processes, after that with the transitional discharge model, we've implemented it in multiple places. So I was in, a, in uh, six different provincial hospitals trying to change the uh, discharge practices. And all of a sudden, across all six sites, we were interviewing people in homeless shelters after and thinking, what the heck's gone on here? Mm. Uh, and and that was part of um, why I started looking at th this area because that clearly something had happened. Um, I, at the, the same time, I had gotten with, within one month, um, I had gotten calls from two different community agencies in London, one about men and one about women, saying, what are we doing about all these people with mental illness that are showing up? Mm -hmm. One was in terms of that men's mission. Uh, and um, the, uh, they say and then another group with women, uh, which uh, then you know led to uh, Mar Margaret's Haven, et cetera. Uh, but something was clearly going on and if i and i was saying i didn't get that message my uh, oldest son who was in high school at the time um one of his friends that had been over um they had a, both had an interest in art uh their family became homeless his his mother had schizophrenia mm -hmm. uh, father had a mood disorder uh and anyway this the situation went bad with the parents so that that uh young fellow ended up in our basement uh, many times. Uh, and, and despite my back 
background, I was having a really hard time getting getting him housing because he himself didn't have a mental illness. He was close to 16, so CAS didn't want to get involved. Uh, so clearly the, the landscape had changed. And what the landscape, uh, we, working with the community members, we had our first Cura Community University Research Alliance on mental health. And what we really found is that a number of things related to housing policy had definitely changed uh, during this period. Uh, um, that housing had been downloaded from the federal level to the provincial level, that the provinces didn't want it, basically ripped up contracts that the building hadn't started. Um, and uh, in Ontario, then we ended up with it downloaded to the municipal level, and the same thing happened. So we had a huge diminishment in the uh, public housing sector. Um, this is the short story. At the same time, we had... Um, uh, the uh, income supports were very much uh, threatened, or you may recall, during the Harris years, we had a, a, a big decrease in the funding that was available for people that did not increase for over a decade. Uh, and mental health deinstitutionalization was happening at the same time. Now, it's a good thing to treat people in the community, particularly with the new medications. People don't have to be in hospital, but it was often forgotten that there's a lot of other things uh, that a hospital provides, like food uh, in, in terms of your your, your area, housing, um, the ability to be with other people. And so in many ways, it was a perfect storm. Um, and in many ways, we haven't uh, we haven't gotten out of that storm and the storm has gotten worse because we've had more threats to the housing market over the last number of years. The income support, I, I often talk about this as a game of musical chairs. If you think of the, the chairs uh, as being the available housing in a community that people at low end can come afford, then think of the people circling uh, as the people that need to access that housing. So clearly, um, if there's fewer chairs than people circling, you're going to have a homeless problem. But two things to keep in mind. One, when the the people lose their housing when the music stops, there's a, there's a transition point, a change in their life that they become vulnerable. And we need to understand those vulnerabilities. But the other thing is not everybody gets an equal chance in the game of musical chairs. Some people are faster. Uh, some people are, have have personal struggles that may slow slow down their time to grab the chair. So it's, it's not a an equal playing field. Uh, and for people with mental illness, uh, we know that's the most stigma, including addiction, that's the most stigma, stigmatized group in society. Uh, this has been shown worldwide, uh, you know, WHO, et cetera. This is the most stigmatized yeah. group. So if you don't have the public housing stock, you're relying on the rental market. Uh, and uh, and, and people often don't look at that being an, an, an issue. They're seeing the homeless population as this homogenized group and often forgetting um, about, well, who are the people who doesn't get the seats uh, when, when the music stops? Yeah. And, and it's not random. Yeah, I... <laughs> I really hear what you're saying. I mean, I think I, I was a food bank director when that all that stuff was down. Mm -hmm. the, the, the I'm sure you government. remember. I'm sure you yeah. remember. I and do. Well, and and yeah. I, I remember going to uh, city hall meetings and other things and talking about it. But the assurances, you know, the rationale then was, look, they would get people would get better help in halfway houses in communities, mm -hmm. right, where they would have all of these other supports that made to some degree a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. But you need the resources to have those supports. And those did not transpire. They did not. They when did the downloading not. happened. They right? did not. For over a decade, there was no increase at all in community health services. I think it was like 11, 12 years before the community mental health services saw that reduction, despite this massive uh, reduction in hospital beds. Um, so what ended up happening in the mental health system um, it, it always happens when you're short on resources, it gets rationed. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so a lot, when you look at the policies that happened in the period after that, and, and to some extent still covers us today, so the people with the most serious mental illness were prioritized, but a, and they truly needed it. They were very vulnerable in terms of getting into mental health services I'm referring to. Yeah. 
but that totally elim- so it, it, it's like saying we're, we have a cancer epidemic so wait till you're stage four and then come for help yeah uh, it, it totally Im- eliminates early intervention. It totally in- eliminates prevention. Uh, and so we, we've not only had a massive homelessness problem, we, we've really had a neglected mental mental. And, and people often use mental health and mental illness as if they're two different things. I, I really think it's part of the stigma. It's like mental illness is so horrible, we can't even say the world will pretend it's, it's, it's mental health. Yeah. Uh, people don't make that confusion with physical. If you're talking about your physical health, are you having, how's your physical health? You don't think that you're being asked if um, if you need a wheelchair. Um, you, you'd be talking about illness or disability, uh, but, but it's like we've confabulated this whole field so much that, that when people say mental health, they may in fact be meeting, meaning mental illness. Both are important concepts, yeah. but they're not the same concept. No. And it seems to me that uh, it's gotten out of control, but it's also partly out of control because of a lack of understanding. So when I interviewed Mike Savage uh, on one of these shows, for instance, he and I were MPs together. We were in poverty committees together as MPs, but he's now the mayor of Halifax into his third term. He's now the chair of the big city mayors. Mm. So as he and I were talking on the on the show a couple of months ago, he said, look, we've just come back from these meetings in Manitoba with all the big city mayors. Yeah, yeah. London was there. And he said, our number one problem through the whole thing was homelessness. Every single community had that. And we had no idea how to handle it. Uh, you know, because the funding just wasn't there, or all of a sudden it just seemed to, it just seemed to kind of erupt uh, in communities across the country. But he said something I thought that was very interesting is that uh, as a result of all of that, they really also don't have an understanding of the people that are in that system. I- Absolutely. Absolutely. They're concentrating too much on, ju- well, not too much, but it's important, yeah. but on the shelter. And and I do wonder, um, you know, there are many people who I speak with who say we need to get back to that larger model again, the larger institutional model, you know, the psychiatric institutes or those kind of things. Yeah, you've been around in this for some time. What, what's your view of that? Well, that's kind of what we've actually done. Like if you go back um uh, and and oh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm blocking on the person's name, but there was a per, a person that looked at history and mental health. Um, it'll come to me later, but uh, had done an analysis of when the provincial psychiatric hospitals were first built in the mid 1800s, yeah. uh, and the Hansard documents about the discussion and what the discussion was at that time is that people with mental illness were being found in the poor houses and that that was inhumane. Mm. Uh, and so therefore they needed asylum uh, from from this from, from these harsh circumstances. So it's kind of like a 150 year cycle because what's the modern equivalent of a poor house, if not a shelter? Um, and uh, so uh, it, it's just a different. Inst- so we have it. We've, we've continued to institutionalize people. We've just moved them to a different institution mm. uh, oh, and, and, and kind of gone back to 150 years uh, to the nature of the institution. Uh, I, I think understanding the population is is very, very important. I, I think um, two solutions I see, I see. Like one, I think even going back to the model of musical chairs tells you about it, different interventions. If a problem relates to the lack of chairs, yes, you do need to have different ways. Like, And, and having having access to chairs is not just about building there's other things like rent rent supplements that um uh municipal bylaws that, that make it easier to rent harder to rent ability to build a granny suite or not build a granny like there's different ways you can increase those chairs if you see that as one of the things you have to do but you also have to deal with poverty issues because that's who's circling around uh and if we don't address poverty um and reduce those people circling again, you'll have a problem. Um, interesting during the pandemic with the um, with the CERB and the 2000, you know, it, it was almost a, um, a basic income experiment, yeah. even though our basic ex- income experiment got, um, got squashed. Uh, 
but but a lot of people had uh, were able to move out of poverty during that that period. Uh, but the other thing, as I said, is these transition points and understanding those transition points also means really dissecting who is the population. Oh, over the years, I've I've come up with my community partners and collectively with people with lived experience, we've looked at multiple solutions for different subpopulations. It's absolutely not a one size fits all. And I think that that's often part of the problem. People um, just kind of throw everybody in a, in a lump together and they're usually yeah. thinking of some middle-aged male, uh, single that with an addiction issue. And, and then that's where, where we're gonna focus things. Um, I, I remember at one point I had one study where we were working with YOU very carefully, as well as other community partners on this one, looking at homeless youth. Um, at the same time, and working with people like FAC and, and uh, the, the federal group at the time, uh, Homeless Partnering Strategy, uh, we're looking at homeless veterans. And it was really interesting uh, in terms of the contrast in needs uh, between the, those two groups. Both of those groups avoided shelters um, if they possibly could. Um, the youth were saying, there's just too much structure, there's too many rules, I can't be myself, uh, you know, I, you know I, I would rather be with my street family, go, you know, like they would often end up in a situation where somebody would rent a one bedroom or bachelor apartment, 20 kids would move in, they'd be evicted within three months, someone else would get a place, you know, so there's this cyclical thing, but they were often not found that you'd see some youth in the shelter, but nowhere near uh, what we found. We, we actually recruited in a very short period of time, 186 youth. We were only aiming for 150 and we overshot within, I think within six weeks, um, we ended and we ended up over overshooting. Um, the veterans, um, they also avoided the shelter. Part of military struck uh, culture is very much about structure. And they said, I can't stand going to the shelters too loosey goosey. There's not enough rules. <laughs> so, <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> they, like they're, they're, there's no, and, and, and in fact, when we would find homeless veterans, it, 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 they were often living in the rough. Um, we actually found in one uh, encampment, they, they even had a, there were several living together, even had a, like a little sheet set up as to who's responsible for meals, which day, what's going to happen at what time. Mm -hmm. uh, they would come into the community uh, for appointments, for specific uh, things, and show up at the shelter. And if you found them in the shelter, they were probably cleaning the tables. Yeah. Uh, because they're trying to create uh, some structure. So the needs are almost opposite. Um, or in many ways, they are opposite. So, But if you just added them together and divide it by two, you go, well, the shelter's got it exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, meets the needs of everybody. Um, and, and then when you get into issues like homeless families, um, you know, um, we, we talked about people with with, with long term addiction. Like I think uh, people, um, you know, people with different kinds of mental health problems, people coming out of hospital. Like I, I think we really, um, you know, we need to tease it out the subpopulations and get very specific strategies for these for the specific populations to really be able to support somebody. Like understand who who is walking around uh, the, the, in that game and who consistently is missing the chairs yeah. and what are the needs of the people who miss the chairs. Yeah. Um, you know, even with mental illness um, being a risk factor, most people with mental illness do not become homeless, right? Yeah. Yeah. The vast majority of people with mental illness do not become homeless. Mm -hmm. What is it ab about the people who do? Yeah. Uh, and what we found often early childhood trauma, a lack a lack of supports generally, they, a very very small social network, so that they can't call in on that social capital. It's not only that they don't have financial capital, they don't have social capital. Uh, it's one of the reasons we often work with uh, peer support and de developing social networks. But but it's a why is it that you know even within a population this group happens with the people who are veterans why is it that some veterans end up in this situation yeah. um in ours uh, in, in the us and most of the literature they talk about ptsd we found in the canadian context it was mostly about alcoholism mm -hmm. 
yeah. uh, and and that they the, the um, that they started drinking while in the military uh, had difficulty uh, um, getting it back to civilian life, uh, but then the, that that was the point where the drinking uh, became became very difficult so uh you know a very a very different pattern than say in the american literature which probably makes up over 80 85 percent of all the literature on homeless veterans where it's ptsd um so we ha we have to understand these unique sit situ situations for these subgroups in order to actually support people um getting out of homelessness and understanding who's not who's not why are they not grabbing the chairs and and, and the way we do that is we talk to those people say mm -hmm. okay you're in this situation how, how did you get into this situation what yeah. would it take to get you out of this and then understanding it collectively um and then building solutions based on what people are telling us yeah we've only got five minutes left mm. so, um sorry <laughs> I, no no this is really important it's why i want to talk to you more if you're open to that in the future but i do i really see See out there just as somebody who's a, a lame in layman terms as somebody's out there who's trying to feed hungry families uh it was, i see people talking about homelessness they talk about high acuity or low acuity or high threshold or low threshold and but increasingly i'm hearing that it's one or the other mm, it needs mm. to be one or the other and for a lot of the younger activists they really want the lower thresholds you know to deal with some of those things but those that have been around longer or they they want more in the way of disciplines or higher thresholds as mm -hmm. people come in and what you're saying is let's not go down that road that's a highly dangerous road what we really need is a variety of those different approaches to yes. meet the various yes. needs that are there is that correct yeah, yeah, it's not a one size fits all. And the more we do that, the more we're going to systematically exclude certain groups. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think I think our problem is, is that we're sitting here as a food bank. You know, today is what I'm talking to you is election day and mm -hmm. fewer and fewer people in the, are province. To, <laughs> in the province, that's right. Fewer and fewer people are, are looking to uh politics to solve a lot of these problems they see dysfunction and things like that in it and it's really requiring more of communities and yet i really do believe that communities as they look at the homeless uh, situation and they want to deal with it they actually don't know how to do it mm -hmm. the politicians mm -hmm. don't know how to do it those in administration really don't either because ended up in this thing all of a sudden and it was yeah. all coming out also during the COVID time so it's just a mishmash of all of these things yeah. and they're trying to make a certain sense out of it i'd like to have a, another couple of these sessions with you sure. Carol. maybe you could map out a bit of a roadmap for us as london as to how then would we handle that yeah. what would be your encouragement for all those different politics yeah. and community and others to do would you be open to that oh I, absolutely like i like it's one of what we call wicked problems because of the complexity it covers all levels of government federal provincial municipal and it crosses so many sectors income support yeah. housing um, uh, health, mental health. So it, it 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 does require looking at it from the specific framework and appreciating that complexity. Yeah. Well, look to me to be contacting you shortly. <laughs> Thanks to the folks at Lawson for being so gracious and letting you do it. But I honestly think after being involved in all of these meetings, you know, mayor's panel meetings, anti-poverty meetings, we yeah. actually don't know how to get out of this. There's easy answers. The government just needs to give more money or whatever it is, or we need low acuity or high acuity, whatever. It's not. It's a really complex thing. And we need people like you to help us to do that. And we need to listen to you. So if in the next session, we can do that i think that would be a real help to us because it's not just that you're looking at this from an academic level you actually hit the ground running on all of this stuff with all of the different projects that you did yeah i i'm not interested in saying what is it like to be homeless well we already know it's horrible uh i i'm because of this part of this participatory approach has come up with solutions yeah. uh to come up with solutions that people 
on the front lines, lived experience, and then implement them, evaluate them, and then take them to scale so that other other communities can also use them. That's really good. So maybe next week or whenever we do it, can we start following the four check plan? <laughs> as to how to, with some of the experiences that you have, at least to start talking about what's the best way out of this morass that we're in that, that mm-hmm. deals with lived experience and lots of research that's gone along with it. I think that would be helpful. Thank you, sure. Cheryl. I really appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Always nice to chat with you. Okay, that's great. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. I'm Mike Jack. I've broken multiple world records for eating some of the world's hottest peppers. Now, I'm challenging London restaurants to make some of the world's hottest food. Watch Jack Up the Heat Mondays at 5.30. watching Rogers TV. 